Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the famous traveling poems, Salut au monde, and we are looking now at sections 4 through 10. Now the reason that we're going to look this way at a whole group of these is because we'll call this the I C passage. I mean, think of it this way. In sections 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 will be skipped because of some situations that we will explain here in a while. And then uh, finally, 10. In those sections, in sections um, 4, um, we'll have I see 16 times, 5, 13 times, 6, 13 times, 7, 23 times the words I see get used in passage 8, eight times, and finally in passage 10, 21 times, with a I, um, I behold to use twice, uh, as well as twice in section 4. For a combined just I sees of 94. Now, this will drive some people absolutely bonkers. Let's just say it out loud. There are people who hate, learn to hate Walt Whitman because of these kind of, you know, cataloging types of poems. And in fact, in his own time, there were, there were readers and critiquers of Whitman's Leaves of Grass that said, I'm sorry, but this is just not poetry. However, I think that there's something compelling about the repetitions, the for as we've seen it, uh, the, this idea that there's, there's, uh, there's always something coming next. And again, we said we are in the Psalms section. That is, that, that, that is to say that repetition song section. And so the um, anaphora that we will see oftentimes in Leaves of Grass is going to just really be celebrated here. Now, as, uh, as um, we, you get into your study of Whitman and Leaves of Grass, Salute Amon is a great place to sit down with your Google especially Google Image. And every time you meet a place you've never heard of, uh, go ahead and type it in. I've had students that do this. I've even had students that make this list and say, all the places that are mentioned here, I want to someday be able to say I actually saw with my own eyes. Now that would be quite a challenge given the number of places we're about to quote unquote visit here. Now one of the questions before we get into this study, one of the questions that always has come up in, in Whitman scholarship is, how did Whitman know about all these places? Where did Whitman learn his geography? A lot will uh, fall on the fact that he was a journalist. Remember, he was also a teacher. And so he spent time reading in newspapers and in, uh, in geography texts and reading atlases. He's a great lover of maps and cartography. And so he's going to throw a whole bunch of different names here in this poem. That can we say out loud, people today don't know many of these places. People of Whitman's day didn't know many of these places either. I mean, for example, he'll mention Medina, which for many modern readers of this poem today, we go, oh yeah, Medina, of course we know about that because of all of the understandings with the, the great religion of Islam. But not in Whitman's day. I mean, for him to throw some of the language that he throws around is going to be stunning to a whole lot of people. But here's what it did do. It led a lot of readers of Whitman's day and beyond to take down an atlas and to start saying, whoa, the world is this amazing place with all these, all these references. And he will cover pretty much the entire globe as we get into this passage. Now, I wish that I had time to just actually read all of the passage and then come back to exegete. We just don't have time. So let's go right to it. Now, if the opening lines of passage 3 is, what do you hear, Walt Whitman? And we've already uh, discussed that. So let's make sure we got our assess assumptions out of the way. Our hope is that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net. Down that left-hand side, talks with Walt. And our hope is that you've been following us, annotating your own copy of Leaves of Grass, all the way from the very beginning, inscriptions, poems, up through and including passage 3 of Salute Amon. And you'll remember that the opening lines of Salute Amon is, what do you hear, Walt Whitman? And now we'll open passage 4 with, what do you see, Walt Whitman? By the way, just to remind, do you remember in Song of Myself, passages 9, passages 15, passages 33, this question about, what can you see? Um, we're going to play this game over and over again. Whitman, in some ways, brilliantly plays the game, as we said in many lectures of Song of Myself, where he's kind of like the middle person, the middleman, the, 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 the prism through which you see all these different things. And here, of course, we've got Whitman, the poet, writing a poem where he asks, what do you see? Obviously, in conversations with his spirit, as maybe we'll say it. What do you see, Walt Whitman? Who are they you salute? Notice here he uses the English spelling of salute. And that one after another 
salute you. That is to say, the symbiotic nature of leaves of grass. And then he'll begin. I see a great round wonder. We heard this word wonder before. It's one of the central words of leaves of grass rolling through space. We mentioned already Whitman's love of the new science, as he called it. I see diminutive farms, hamlets. We're going to get a list of ten. Start the listing. Let it start. Hamlets, ruins, graveyards, jails, factories. Notice this is an interesting list right away because it covers the entire span of human existence. Palaces, hovels, huts of barbarians. Now the fact that he uses the term barbarians and later savages throughout Leaves of Grass, we've asked this question. To what degree is Whitman a racist? To what degree is he influenced by the racism of his day? No question, we're even going to see it here in the passages we're about to work with. And yet, we're going to look through and beyond some of his uh, you know, cultural racism to recognize that there's clearly something celebratory about what's going on as he, as he speaks of all these different people. Tents of nomads upon the surface, obviously we're talking now the globe. I see, again, over and over again. Shaded part on one side where the sleepers are sleeping. We'll come back to his classic poem, Sleepers Letter. And the sunlit part on the other side. In other words, he says, I am physically looking at a globe with you guys. Let's celebrate that globe. I see the curious, I told you this is one of his favorite, favorite words, curious rapid change of the light and shade. We cannot read a line like that and not think, of course, of Lao Tzu's uh, um, Dao Te Ching and, of course, the Yin Yang symbol and William Blake's influence of songs of innocence, songs of experience. There's polarities, always polarities, right? I see distant lands as real and near to the inhabitants of them as my land is to me. In other words, in their own right, Whitman will point out already at 2A, let's put this in our notes as a possible message, in, our, in its own right, all people are patriots to the land from which they come. Then he begins first by mentioning waters, plenteous waters. Then he goes to mountains, and he'll start messing around with lots of them. I see mountain peaks, the Sierras of, uh, of, of the Andes, where they range. I see plainly the Himalayas, uh, the Shanshas from China, right? The Altais, the Siberian mountains, uh, the, the uh, Guts, the, um, the British from British India. I see the great pinnacles of Uberes, and, and again, each one of these, I recommend, these are all from the Caucasus, but I recommend that you go and take a look at these. The Oberus, uh, one of the highest peaks in, in uh, Russia. Um, Kazbek, um, uh, um, again, on the Russian-Georgian border, right? The uh, Bazaraji, um, again, from the, uh, uh, from the Russian and Azerbaijan um, area. I see the uh, Styrian Alps and the Karnak Alps, again, Austrian and Italian Alps, right? I see the Pyrenees, right, which, of course, will separate, as we know, France from Spain. Um, the Balks, the Carpathians, and to the north, the uh, Dorf uh, uh, Fields and off at Sea Mount Helka, the volcano in southeast uh, Iceland. Notice we're jumping all over the place, right? Everywhere from Yemen to uh, Central Eastern Europe and the Czech Republic and Romania to Norway and to Switzerland. Then he'll go to Vesuvius and Etna. Of course, we're talking here now Sicily and Italy, right? The Mountains of the Moon. Ptolemy uh, will, uh, in fact, name that area of the interior of Africa. Africa, the mountains of the moon, the red mountains of Madagascar. I mean, let's just pause for a moment and point out, just in this one passage, how amazing it is that he will, that he will name all of these different mountains in some ways. We have said this before already in other lectures. In some ways, mountains always define us, because mountains are always about stories. I mean, we think of Sinai, for example, as mentioned, although Sinai itself, not mentioned in this poem, will certainly be referenced, no question about that, right? I see, and then he'll continue. I see the Libyan, Arabian, Asiatic deserts. Now we're going to go to the big deserts, the huge, dreadful Arctic and Antarctic icebergs. So now we're going to the polar, to the polar ends of the globe. I see the superior oceans, the inferior ones, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Sea of Mexico, the Brazilian Sea, the Sea of Peru, all of the different waters, the waters of the Hindustan, the China Sea, the Gulf of Guinea, the, ja the Japan waters, the beautiful Bay of Nagasaki, landlocked in its mountains. The spread of the Baltic, Caspian, Bothia, the Swedish, uh, the British shores, the Bay of Biscay, France, right? The sun-cleared Mediterranean and from one to another of its islands, the White Sea, north northwest corner of Russia, the sea around Greenland, it's all over the place. And then he skips and or, or leaves I see and goes to I behold. I behold the mariners of the world. So notice we're going to go from physical geography to now the individuals who are the great explorers, right? Now 
Whitman loves to celebrate explorers. He'll write a whole poem to Columbus. And of course, we, uh, we today obviously have to admit and say out loud the horrors of Columbus in his exploration. But we don't want to overlook as well the exploration of that time. And see here, we're going to get that celebration as well. I behold the mariners of the world. Some are in storms, some in the night with the watch at the, at the lookout, some drifting helplessly, some with contagious diseases. It's an interesting line. We're going to come back to it in Song of the Open Road. What is this thing with the infirm? What is this thing with people who are ill? What is this, pro what is this thing with, I'll even accept the people who are ill. Well, he, w he was a nurse, of course, during the war, and he saw a lot of terrible things of illness and the like, and here it will find its way. I behold the sail and the steamships of the world, some in clusters and ports, some on their voyages, and now we're going to get a whole bunch of different types of places where people can sail. Obviously, readers of uh, Leaves of Grass will know Melville's Moby Dick and other books like it that talk about sailing. Some double the Cape of Storms. Of course, this is where Bartholomew Diaz called the uh, Cape of Good Hope, right? Some Cape Verde, uh, the westernmost point, of course, of Africa, others Capes, and then we've got a whole bunch of them. He'll mention um, Gudfari, the, um, the Somali Cape, uh, Bon, Tunis, Africa, um, Bajador uh, as well, that is to say Barbary. Um, others, by the way, this no, notice the repetition of others. We're going to get 15 of these others. Others, Dondra Head, Salon. Others, past the Straits of Sunda, that is to say Sumatra or Java, what would be called as well the Thousand Islands, and obviously there's a whole lot of history going on there. Others, Cape Lup uh, Lupathka, um, uh, Lupathka, and others, uh, the Bering Strait, so you've got all these different kinds of straits. Others, Cape Horn, we're talking Chile. Notice we're just jumping around all over the place, right? Um, others sail the Gulf of Mexico or along Cuba or Haiti. Others Hudson Bay or Baffins Bay in, in, in Greenland, right? Uh, others pass the Straits of Dover. Now we're to England, of course. Others enter the Wash. Others the uh, Firth of Soloway, uh, that is to say Scotland, England, right? The North Sea. Others round Cape uh, Clear. Now we're to Ireland. Others the Land's End, or of course Cornwall the, uh, and, and England. Others traverse the, the uh, Zuder Z um, or the Schelle. These are, of course, rivers of France, Belgium, and, and the Netherlands, right? Others as comers and goers at Gibraltar or the Dardanelles. Others sternly push their way through the northern winter packs. Others descend or ascend the Obi or the Lena, that is to say the inlet of the Arctic Ocean north of Siberia. So we're going all over the place. Others the Niger or the Congo. Others the Indus or the bump from Puter and Cambodia, obviously Asian rivers, right? Um, others wait streamed up, ready to start in the ports of Australia. Wait at Liverpool, Glasgow, Dublin, Marseille, Lisbon, Naples. Uh, these are all major ports of the day. Hamburg, Bremen, Bordeaux, The Hague, Copenhagen. Wait at Valpregio, Rio Janeiro. Notice the D is not in this poem, right? Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Panama. So you've got this uh, interesting listing in, in section four. Then in section five, now there is some debate about why does he even have these different sections if we continue with this IC. But notice we're going to move from the geography of the earth to now some landmarks on the earth created especially by humans. Now think about this. May the 10th, 1869, you have the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific that are going to meet at uh, Promontory Point, of course, in Utah, right? Think about how compelling that kind of an invention is for somebody who is a great writer like Whitman. I see the tracks, passage five now. I see the tracks of the railroads of the earth. I see them in Great Britain. I see them in Europe. I see them in Asia and in Africa. The railroads will, of course, conquer. Some will say as well destroy, but certainly conquer the earth all over the world, right? They'll have the building of the railroads, and of course the building of the railroads will be both good, great, as well as horrific. We think about Conrad's Heart of Darkness in that grove scene as we've referenced it many times. Then, from there we go to other technologies, not just railroads. Think about this one. Invented in 1837, the telegraph, right? Samuel Morris on the 24th of May, 1844, will send out his first, um, his first use of the telegraph. I see the electric telegraphs of the earth. I see the filaments of the news of the wars. Notice here your list of five. Wars, death, losses, gains, passions of my race, the human race, right? I see the long river stripes of the earth, and now all of a sudden we're back to rivers again. It's almost as if he just can't leave the, his, his love, his appreciation of the globe. It just kind of blows his mind, the power of looking at the globe. Um, I see the long river stripes of the earth, the Amazon, the Paraguay. I see the four great rivers of China, the Amur, uh, the river of East Asia, right? The Yellow River, the Yangtze, the, the Pearl. I see where they sign falls, where the Danube, the Lore, 
the Rhone, uh, the great uh, Guadalquivir uh, River uh, um, in southern Spain. I see the windings of the Volga, the Napier, the Order. These are all, of course, Russian and Ukraine rivers. I see the Tuscan going down the Arno, the Venetian along the Po. I see the uh, Greek seamen sailing out of uh, Aegean Bay. Um, I, and, and that's the end of Passage 5, and then we're, back, we're, we're right into it with Passage 6. Again, it's almost as if there's no real break here. I see the side of the old empire of Assyria. So now all of a sudden, we move from technology and rivers now to history. Uh, Whitman was a great lover of history. He was very influenced by all of the different historic events that were happening. And uh, as we get in now into passage six, we're going to use some of our Norton's uh, work as we've used in the past to kind of help us out as well, all right, as we, as we head towards uh, some of this reading. I see the site of the old empire of Assyria. Notice this thing about old empire. He, it's as if Whitman realizes that he's writing a poem for a new empire that will someday be an old empire. And even though we're not that old, and it doesn't seem that long ago, 1855, we still find ourselves saying, you know, it's interesting the way that now we've become one of the great empires on the planet. When Whitman writes, we're not there yet, and yet he will reference here the old empires of Assyria, Persia, India, he says it, I see the falling of the Ganges over the high rim of Saqqara. Um, uh, let me just give you a, a, a real fast um, um, understanding of this one from our, from our Nortons. Saqqara uh, is, is probably the accurate spelling here uh, in Whitman's source, reflected in his manuscript in the first edition of the poem in 1856. Saqqara is a familiar alternative name for Siva, an ancient Hindu literature in ancient Hindu literature, the male divinity associated with both destruction and rebirth, hence fertility. From the head of Siva, or Sankara, sprang the Ganges, cascading over the high rim of his hair, which was piled in rows of curls above the brow. The present line and the next are the remnant of four in the manuscript, which substantiate the idea above. The Sanskrit, the ancient poems and laws, the idea of gods incarnated by their avatars in men and women, the falling of the waters of the Ganges over the high rim of Saqqara. The poems descended safely to this day from poets of 3,000 years ago, right? Um, now, let's just read that passage. I see the uh, falling of the Ganges over the high rim of Saqqara. I see the place of the idea of the divinity. Now, borrowing heavily, obviously, from Emerson, his love of Emerson, incarnated by avatars in human forms in so many of the world religions. There is some sense of that incarnation happening, right? A, I see spots of the succession of priests. We've talked about Whitman in this poem believing himself to be a, a priest of a kind. Priests on the earth, oracles, sacrificers, Brahmins, Sabines, um, of course, a originally semi uh, semi Christian sect of Babylonia, later a semi Muslim sect of Mesopotamia. Um, lamas, of course, um, here what we know about the Tibetan priests, right? Um, uh, monks, muftis, obviously the uh, official expounders of of Islamic law, right? Um, exhorters. That is to say, right, celebrators of the theology. I see where Druids walked in the groves of Mona. I see the mistletoe and the vermin. Now, this thing about the groves of Mona from your Nortons here, it's a, a, the Latin name for Anglicia, country of North Wales, okay? And, um, and, and, um, and, and then just to finish this one, I see the mistletoe and the vervain um, in, in European mellow like mistletoe, a legendary association with Druid worship. So obviously we're playing the, the ancient game. I see the temples of the deaths of the bodies of gods. You can't help but read a passage like this and think about Nietzsche's famous God is Dead passage. We've spoken about it elsewhere at Winstrung.net. I see the old signifiers. That is to say, Whitman is a great understander of the power of ancient faith and the importance of ancient faith, which is why, of course, our reading of Whitman will lead us often to say the new is the new. That is to say the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Then a break. And he knows what he's doing. There's no question. He's aware of the iconoclastic nature of what he's about to do. He starts with the ancient religions. And now he's ready to speak, of course, of the religion of his days, namely Christianity. 
Let's see how he deals with this. And we're going to come back to this when we read to him that was crucified, probably the most direct statement of his Christian theology. We'll get to it later. I see Christ eating the bread of his last supper in the midst of youths and old persons. Now, obviously, the, uh, the Last Supper portrait was known to all the readers of, most of the readers of Leaves of Grass. I see where the strong, divine young man, the Hercules, toiled faithfully and long and then died. Notice how I put Christian theology and Christ next to Hercules. I see the place of the innocent, rich life and hapless fate of the beautiful nocturnal sun, the full-limbed Bacchus. Now, of course, here we cannot, I mean, we can't, we can't miss it, obviously. He's making references to the ancient poem, the ancient play uh, of Bacchae. I see Knaf uh, blooming, dressed in blue. Um, this Knaf, of course, is Egyptian mythology, a god with the body of a man and the head of a sheep, right? Okay. Um, now, we'll, we'll say this again later, but... Whitman was a great lover of Egyptology, and he loved to talk and think about the, the Egyptian um, uh, motifs. I see Kanaf blooming dressed in blue with the crown of feathers on his head. I see Hermes unsuspected, dying, well-beloved, saying to the people, and then here for one of the only times other than the title Salute Amon, he's going to use italicized, do not weep for me, this is not my true country, I've lived banished from my true country, I now go back there, I return to the celestial spirit where everyone goes in his turn. Um, our, our, um, uh, our Norton suggests that in Greek mythology, of course, Hermes is the messenger of the gods. Walt Whitman took this passage of Alkanoff and Hermes almost literally from uh, Volney's ruins. And it's interesting when you look at it again, think about, we're talking about a poet who feels at times rejected by those who are reading his poetry, and this is the quote, look at it again. Do not weep for me, this is not my true country. I have lived banished from my true country, I now go back there, I return